Like many kinds of compositions, especially written ones that tell a story or that introduce us to a new concept or a new field of inquiry, novels like The Age of Innocence have to prepare readers to accustom themselves to the imaginative or conceptual conditions of the fictional world that they're entering. There is a privileged position for doing this, just as there are privileged positions at the beginnings of other artistic compositions, like the prelude to a symphony or the overture to a musical. These openings have special work to do. I say they're privileged because the listener, or the reader in this case, looks for cues at the outset, comes to the opening pages of a novel anticipating some indication of where they're going, or where they are in time and space, whom we will meet, and what the larger themes and conflicts of the book will be. Artists know this, and if good, anticipate what we anticipate. Even your own academic papers usually begin with the occasion and topic of the essay to orient the reader, as well as the reasons for pursuing it, the method of pursuing it, and its importance to understanding something new about the topic. Likewise, the opening camera shots of a movie establish its tone, color palette, characters, mood, and pace. Even a non-linguistic art form like architecture uses archways and thresholds, entry halls, stairwells, and foyers to bring the moving body into a space different from the one it occupied. These spaces transition us from the outside to the inside. They bring us deeper. They're not sites of permanent stillness where one can linger, but more like transitional and temporarily occupied spaces that condition those who pass through them. It's the same thing with literary texts, except that the materials composing the narrative structure are not bricks or musical notes, of course, but keywords and images. As you know, the reader enters the fictional domain of the Age of Innocence through a building, the old Academy of Music where the first scene is set. It's a somewhat cramped, crowded, overheated space. It has a close, exclusive, clubby feel to it. We have, like the audience, come inside from a cold January evening to see an opera about a devil seducing a virgin. This, of course, is Charles Gounod's popular opera, Faust, and it's worth comparing this seduction story to that of Newland Archer's far less dramatic attempt to pursue an affair with May's cousin, Ellen Olenska. In the book, it's the opera that's fiction, but the effect is to render the fiction we're reading less fictional, or more realistic than it actually is. The point, I think, for us is to observe what our own interaction with the novel is about, just as the opera the characters are watching gives them the opportunity to project their emotions or displace them onto characters less real than they are. To encounter an object of culture, whether in opera or reading a novel, instructs us about what art can do to us, how it can goad us, or shape our responses, or model a view of what's possible or forbidden in the world we live in.
paralleling their physical movement into the opera house, and in the middle, remember, of the actual performance, is the cognitive, imaginative movement of the reader from the world of everyday life to a new artificial consciousness of a different kind of reality, a fictional one. As we come to read the book, the characters in that book have come to the Academy of Music to be entertained, swept away from the world in a way that simultaneously brings them deeper into it. They are, in a word, like us. Their relationship to the work of art being performed is meant to echo or model our own relationship to the work of literature that we're reading. And one thing more. Imagine, if you will, that the entire narrative of the novel is a composed structure like a house or a building you enter. Like those structures, the novel has what we might call an antechamber, or in this case a narrative antechamber, that sets out the terms of the relationship between the reader and the novel. Before I say more about this uh, metadiscursive dimension of Wharton's opening chapter, it's worth noticing all the practical things the writer accomplishes here. For example, how convenient from the writer's standpoint to be able to introduce readers to the book's major and minor characters almost immediately in the opening scene in which they gather. How economical to show them both individually and in their group identity. Together, they form what the narrator calls society, which of course does not refer in any way to what we might call all the diverse elements of the largest American city in the 1870s. No, society, as it's used in this novel, refers to the upper 1% of the population, many of them descendants of the original Dutch settlers of New York. The family name van der Leiden, for example, is of Dutch origin. At other times, Wharton simply uses New York, or Old New York, as shorthand for this group of elite characters. These are what we call metonyms, using the name of a part to signify the whole. With the apparently simple, practical choice of introducing the characters in their group identity and then zooming in on individuals within that collective, a theme is broadly established. That is, the two identities are inseparable from each other, in tension with each other. Isn't this, in fact, one of the central conflicts experienced by Newland Archer, pulled between his duty to society on the one hand and his individual desires and thoughts on the other. Strangely enough, the novel suggests that our reality is always a social reality, no matter how strongly our imaginations try to convince us otherwise. We've seen this basic premise underlying the sociological analyses of Pierre Bourdieu in his book Distinction, where a certain kind of bourgeois interiority and aesthetic sensibility is the product really largely of class formations related to the dominant capitalist culture and work in service to it. In chapter 12 of book one, for example, as Newland Archer tries to explain to Ellen Olenska the legal consequences of going forward with a divorce from Count Olensky, he ends up saying that, and I quote, the individual in such cases is nearly always sacrificed to what is supposed to be the collective interest. People cling to any convention that keeps the family together, protects the children if there are any, he rambled on, pouring out all the stock phrases that rose to his lips in his intense desire to cover over the ugly reality which her silence seemed to have laid bare, end quote. Putting that connection aside for a while, another aspect of novel openings worth considering here is time. Not so much where the book begins, although that's also important, but when in the sequence of events does it begin? This novel could conceivably begin at any number of points in time, and whatever point it did would always be in medias res, already in the middle of an ongoing sequence of events that have a history and a future. In other words, novels don't begin with origins so much as disruptions of some kind. Disruptions, that is, in the status quo of the particular society or the individual life uh, that the novel represents. In the case of The Age of Innocence, it's not the impending marriage of Newland Archer to Mae Welland that really matters, but the disruption or even the threat to that marriage 
posed by the sudden appearance of a woman whose own marriage has ended, or is about to end, pretty badly. We have to remember, too, that Newland and May are not just any young engaged people. They represent families, tribes, if you will, that have long anticipated their joining together to consolidate a set of very powerful financial and social interests. Ellen Olenska does not just introduce the romantic disruption of a possible adulterous affair. She throws into crisis the steady, predictable, and necessary ritual of marriage that is meant to perpetuate the survival of a clan. You'll notice that in addition to being dropped into the world of Wharton's novel In Medias Res, we're dropped into a performance after it's begun. Like Newland Archer, who follows the convention of arriving fashionably late to the opera, so do we, in a sense. Since Newland will be the center of our consciousness in this novel, he's something of a surrogate for the reader as well, but only up to a certain point. His arriving late has other somewhat darker associations. Literally, he's behind the times. And he's behind the times because he's following a tradition of showing up late. One last thing about the novel's handling of the representation of time. A way to put this is to consider several layers of time operating simultaneously. The easiest and most immediate level to grasp is what we might call the unfolding present moment of the events of the story. By this, I mean the time and space in which the characters, or what narratologists sometimes call existence, are speaking with each other, interacting with each other, or having their own thoughts. This present time is at the same time historically specific, of course. We know, for example, that the main events of Book One take place in the early 1870s. With the additional information that we receive about the passing of time, remember the book's final scenes take place some 20 years later, that whatever present moments we read about are embedded in a longer period of historical time, namely the 1870s to the 1890s. But Edith Wharton's interest in time goes well beyond her exploration of how cultural change occurs Specifically, I don't get the sense from reading this book that human societies evolve or improve with each generation in some inexorable move towards progress and perfection. That kind of trajectory is rife with accidental reversals, unpredictable catastrophes, regressions, and necessary slippages into obsolescence. In the big picture of human civilization, these cycles of growth and contraction are far more visible. Looked at from the point of what we might call deep time, the perspective from the present moment seems rather blind to the cyclical nature of civilization. How does Wharton convey this much deeper time in the novel? Well, I pointed out the last time we met her use of anthropological or ethnographic terminology, and that suggested her interest in these characters as part of a much larger human story. Families are, for her, tribes and clans. Manners are described in the book as totems or taboos. Formal gatherings are called rituals and ceremonies to suggest their structural relationship to other cultures. People, the narrator tells us, are reading books on primitive man. And even beyond this specialized vocabulary, there are more ominous allusions to biological evolution. Wharton drops in this allusion as Newland contemplates his future bride. In chapter 10, we have the following, and I quote, It would presently be his task to take the bandage from this young woman's eyes and bid her look forth on the world. But how many generations of the women who had gone to her making had descended bandaged to the family vault? He shivered a little, remembering some of the new ideas in his scientific books and the much-cited instance of the Kentucky cave fish, which had ceased to develop eyes because they had no use for them, unquote. 
That's on pages 120, 121. An allusion to adaptation, to be sure, but also an echo of possible extinction. This echo becomes more distinctly audible with Wharton's references to the cataclysmic extinction of ancient Pompeii and the lost fragments of Ilium, or what we call Troy, that Newland and Ellen glance at in the Metropolitan Museum. A tag in the display case reads, Use Unknown, a chilling reminder of the passing of time, the passing of even the most civilized societies, forever lost to human memory. Already, the process of rigidification is setting in with the elderly Vander Leidens, who are the top echelon of old New York society, but are described as isolated shut-ins encased in amber like fossils. I mention the Vander Leidens because, considering those characters bring us back down to the level of present time in the novel, where we can see the incremental evolution of this society, this cultured civilization working through a multi-generational family history. The increasing refinement of social types, created in large part by a consolidation of homogeneous traits, carries with it not only an aura of superiority and legitimacy of social rank, but a stiffness or an inflexibility attached to the adherence to convention. That increasing inability to adapt to changes in history, technology, learning, or points of view leads to what was called in the 19th century the condition of over-civilization. The lack of physical vigor, the overstimulation of the nervous system, the cultivation of manners, led to the kind of fragility and infertility of young women like Janie Archer, Newland's unmarried sister, and Sillerton Jackson, the somewhat feeble gossip whose stomach cannot handle Mrs. Archer's sauces. This group of characters all seem rigidified by their culture, and they occupy the generational center of a multi-generational group. Have they always been this way? What came before them, and what after? How do they survive? You get a sense of this sort of social and familial inbreeding with Mr. Sillerton Jackson's account of the history of marriages and relationships in old New York society. The repetition of family names and their almost interchangeability is comic. I quote, Mr. Sillerton Jackson had returned the opera glass to Lawrence Lefferts. The whole of the club turned instinctively waiting to hear what the old man had to say. For old Mr. Jackson was as great an authority on family as Lawrence Lefferts was on form. He knew all the ramifications of New York's cousinships and could not only elucidate such complicated questions as that of the connection between the Mingotts through the Thorleys with the Dallases of South Carolina and that of the relationship of the elder branch of Philadelphia Thorleys to the Albany Chiverses, on no account to be confused with the Manson Chiverses of University Place, but could also enumerate the leading characteristics of each family, as, for instance, the fabulous stinginess of the younger lines of Leffertses, the Long Island ones, or the fatal tendency of the Rushworths to make foolish matches, or the insanity of the Albany Chiverses, with whom their New York cousins had always refused to intermarry, with the disastrous exception of poor Medora Manson, who, as everybody knew, but then her mother was a Rushworth. Let's look closer at three generations and their intermarriages, since marriage is the main means of continuity, but also of hybridity. Obviously, whatever hybridity is achievable over time is diminished as certain traits within families get selected out for preservation, the consolidation of wealth, racial and ethnic purity, and class solidarity, for instance. But hybridity is also essential for the rejuvenation of these family lines, as you can see in the response to the news that the Beauforts have invited to their ball a family by the name of Struthers, people who are not born into the leisure class, but who have made their money through a thriving shoe polish business. The text reads, 
Mrs. Lemuel Struthers had returned the previous year from a long initiatory sojourn in Europe to lay siege to the tight little citadel of New York. Old Mrs. Mingott then says, Of course, if you and Regina invite her, the thing is settled. Well, we need new blood and new money, and I hear she's still very good-looking, the carnivorous old lady declared, end quote. This can be found on page 79. Now, as you look at this genealogy on the slide, note the far ends of the sequence, which indicate just the kind of new blood Mrs. Mingott is talking about. It's no accident that her own father is named Spicer, and that his passionate nature led him to leave his wife for an unnamed but exotic-sounding Spanish dancer. It's telling that Mrs. Mingott, the family matriarch who exhibits a number of unconventional thoughts and eccentricities, calls Newland Archer no Bob Spicer when he proposes to her granddaughter. That's because the vitality of that earlier generation has diminished over time or has been ultra-refined to the point of exhaustion. Interestingly enough, the newest generation pictured in this sequence features the young adult son of May and Newland, the young Dallas Archer, who, at the end of the novel, announces his engagement to Fanny Beaufort. Clearly, this is Julius Beaufort's daughter from his earlier affair with the mysterious outsider named Fanny Ring. And you'll remember how scandalous this affair appeared to hypocrites like Larry Lefferts, who says derisively that there will never be a day when one of them marries the bastard daughter of a Beaufort. So, you see, there's a way out of the conformity and dying conventions plaguing a man of Newland's generation and a man of sensitivity and intelligence that sets him apart from contemporaries like Larry Lefferts. Usually this way out is embodied by other characters who occupy the margins of the dominant culture. People like the cosmopolitan Ellen Olenska, who spent most of her life in the worldly and sophisticated capitals of Europe, or Ned Winsett, the struggling writer who lives in a bohemian, artsy neighborhood that most of Newland's friends would never be dare seen in. There's also Monsieur Riviere, the secretary and possible lover of Ellen Olenska, who fraternizes with French authors like Guy de Maupassant and others, and with whom Newland has had a thoughtful and satisfying conversation about art and ideas. Newland is drawn to these conduits of the wider world because he has curiosity, aesthetic taste, and a vivid imagination. He also, however, has a demanding sense of social respectability and family duty. His ambivalence prevents him from fully living either kind of life, which makes him seem indecisive or even cowardly to some readers. But when you consider his development as a person within the long incremental evolution of history and social transformation, he begins to look more sympathetic, more like a creature caught in the crossroads of historical transition. There's much to say about this character of Newland Archer, but what I'd like to do now is to demonstrate how Wharton's narrative technique actually isolates Newland Archer from the rest of the characters, giving him a special status as the novel's center of consciousness. First, in order to be a center of consciousness, the writer has to find a way to represent that consciousness to the reader. What I mean by consciousness is simply the mind at work, what it observes, what it thinks, how it processes information. Obviously, this is pretty subjective, and individuals often perceive the world in their own way that might diverge from objective reality. As reporters of the truth, individual consciousnesses can be notoriously unreliable. They raise more questions about their story than they can answer or even know. While Newland is the only character in the novel whose thoughts are revealed to the reader, we never know, for example, what May Welland or Ellen Olenska are actually thinking at any given point, Wharton does not let him tell his own story. Some novels do allow that, which we call first-person narration. 
Objective third-person pronoun narrations are usually called omniscient because they seem to come from a point outside, above, or away from the actual events they report. And because of this distancing effect, most third-person narrations are retrospective, telling us things that have already happened. This is the kind of narrator we have in the Age of Innocence. Not a person, exactly, and not quite a character in the book like the others we meet. This narrator is more like a voice. It has a tone. It has knowledge the characters don't have access to. It has a bit of satire to it, or judgment about the people and events it describes. And most of all, it produces a very persuasive effect of telling the truth and having the authority to do so. I said a moment ago that this voice, this position, is at some remove from the present time and space of the characters and actions unfolding in the novel. You'll remember that I talked about that level of time and how it's embedded in larger elements of time. People who study narration as a special field of literary criticism or literary theory refer to the present time-space world of the novel as its diegesis. They use this term also to designate certain styles of narrators. For example, we're pretty confident that the voice narrating The Age of Innocence certainly seems to know this society as if she were a part of it, but nowhere in the actual events of the book does this narrator appear as a participant character. This kind of narrator is therefore referred to as an extra diegetic narrator. A number of variations will no doubt spring to mind in thinking about books you know and like uh, that have different kinds of narrators. The Sound and the Fury, for instance, has three first-person narrators and one third-person narrator. The first three sections of William Faulkner's novel are each told by a different member of the Compson family, each with his or her own voice. Each of them is also actively part of the time-space world of events they report, so we classify them as intradiegetic narrators, while the fourth section has an extra-diegetic narrator. These are just the most basic definitions, and there are as many variations and creative combinations as there are creative writers of fiction. So how does Wharton bring us closer inside Newland Archer's own thoughts in a way that doesn't merely describe them, but that immerses the reader in them? How do we hear those thoughts? The method is referred to as free and direct discourse, and there are several linguistic features that a trained reader should look for. The first one is that the shift from the objective perspective of the third-person narrator into the individual consciousness or the much narrower perspective of one character, is seamless and abrupt. Usually, when an omniscient narrator is merely describing what a character is thinking to himself, the reader will be alerted to that shift by the use of a tagline like Archer thought or it seemed to him. There are no such taglines in free and direct discourse, nor are there any quotation marks used around the words the character is presumably thinking. This absence of tags and punctuation is why this kind of discourse is called free indirect. And just as abruptly and seamlessly the narrator can enter another consciousness, so too can the narrator leave it. Look at this example to see that the contents of Newland's mind or thoughts begins really with the sentence, so close to the powers of evil, etc. Only Newland would make that assumption not the more objective, even-handed narrator. Detecting free indirect discourse requires the reader's sensitivity to differences of tone and diction. Would the narrator use those words and personal judgments, we ask ourselves? The point of noting this distinction is finally about seeing two different levels of knowledge working together. The narrator's more extensive knowledge of these events and people and the individual character's blind spots revealed when the narrator reveals the inner thoughts. 
The sharp disparity allows us to see Newland making errors as he makes them in real time, which produces an overall tone of dramatic irony in the text. Remember, irony is always produced out of a discrepancy between what one thinks one knows and what one already does know. In the song we hear, Marguerite is plucking petals from a daisy and asking, does he love me or does he not love me? Wharton gives us the Italian words, which to English-speaking readers looks a lot like mama, mama. The sheer complexity, even the absurdity, of all the languages that have gone into this production suggests that all of Europe has had a hand in producing this cultural artifact. An artifact consumed by an elite, sophisticated segment of the leisure class. These leisured people who crowd into the old Academy of Music on that winter evening are the set of people that Wharton is most interested in exploring. <laughs> 